Chapter 23 Coming of Age in the Big Apple In addition to playing the part of Michael Brown, my unofficial role during the years of Old Mistress Mine was as Alfred Lunt's personal talent scout. Whether in New York or on the road, I would head out to see the local shows and return to Lunt with the review. If I said the show was good, he would come and watch it with me. Once we were playing in Detroit, and I saw a comedian, Irving Harmon, at a burlesque show at the Avenue Theater, who was very, very funny. Harmon had tremendous long legs, and he would somehow wrap them around his body and twist himself like a giant pretzel, and then he'd sit down as though everything was perfectly normal. It looked so silly that the whole place was hysterical. I told Alfred Lund about it, and the two of us went back the next day, and he loved it as much as me. Many years later, I ran into Irving Harmon. He was a friend of Sammy Smith, an ex burlesque comic who I was working with in the 1974 Broadway show titled Thieves. One day, Irving Harmon came to a rehearsal, and Sammy introduced me to him. Although he had aged greatly, I immediately recognized him as the comic from Detroit. When I told him how much Alfred Lunt had enjoyed his performance, he became incredibly moved and excited. You mean Alfred Lunt was out there watching me? My God, why didn't you come backstage? If I had only known, Harmon's reaction showed just how revered Lunt was among entertainers. This old fellow was genuinely touched by the fact that he had made Alfred Lunt laugh. I went away wishing that I had brought Lunt backstage to see him. Part of the reason Lunt was so revered was because of his own willingness to learn from other actors and comedians. In the early days of his career, Milton Berle recalled seeing the same guy in his audience night after night. This fellow came so often that Milton started to assume he was some kind of an oddball. Then one night, the fellow came backstage. He introduced himself as Alfred Lunt. He wanted to tell Milton how much he had learned watching him. It turned out Alfred was about to do a show with some burlesque humor in it, and he wanted to watch this young comic who was being so highly touted. Milton was floored by it, as well as genuinely humbled. Alfred, of course, also loved high culture, and we would occasionally see the big theater stars together. Once we went with Lynn Fontan to see John Gilgood at the Plymouth Theater performing in Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. The Lunts laughed at Wilde's wit and Gilgood's wonderful performance. In fact, Lynn later wrote the play's producer, Binky Beaumont, telling him how much she and Alfred enjoyed the play, saying that Gilgood made me laugh louder and longer than I have laughed in the theater for years. It was around this time that I ran into a young kid who had his sights firmly fixed on the big time in show business. At first he tried his hand at acting, but his real talents lay elsewhere. Soon we became fast friends, and for a while enjoyed a lot of crazy stuff together. In the end, we were both lucky to come through it all in one piece. I, of course, had no idea whatsoever that this brash, intense, young daredevil would become one of the greatest motion picture producers of the 20th century. For those who might think I'm stretching it a bit, just ask yourself, who else can count among their credits the Godfathers, one and two, Love Story, Rosemary's Baby, and Chinatown? Bob Evans was a 15-year-old kid, about two years younger than me, when I first noticed him hanging around the radio stations. In his autobiography, The Kid Stays in the Picture, he recalls the time when, as he put it, my new best pal was Dickie Van Patten. While I couldn't have predicted his astonishing future career, I did instantly recognize that Bob was a real character. At first, he kind of tagged along after me. He seemed impressed with my status, and years later, he generously wrote that at the time we met, Dickie Van Patten was the top juvenile actor in New York City. Soon I realized we had a lot in common and for a couple of years, we really were, as he says, best pals. 
Bob was absolutely the most determined young man I ever knew. If he decided he wanted something, no matter how crazy or dangerous, he wouldn't stop until he had it, or was not cold in the pursuit. One time, that was literally the case. We were on the shore at Long Beach, New York, and we started a friendly sparring match. Even though it was friendly, we were still tagging each other a good bit, just as we noticed this old, short, fat guy with an overcoat, completely out of place on the beach, watching us fight. I guess he saw that same determined insanity in Bob's eyes that a lot of studio heads and directors would dread over the next 50 years. And so he asked, Do you guys box? We said no, but the old guy just ignored our response and said to Bob, You look pretty good. I'm running some amateur fights tonight. Why don't you come and I'll set you up with one of them? Bob was intrigued, but he told the guy, Look, we're actors. I don't know how to box. That's when I knew I had him. Ten bucks says you're afraid I blurred it out without missing a beat. That settled it. So later that night, we were in the locker room at the Long Beach Stadium on the boardwalk with Bob in some old gym shorts and me lacing up a pair of boxing gloves that the old man had left for him. Bob was in the last fight, number 16 on the card. The beauty of going last, at least the beauty for me, was that we got to watch them all. One bruised, battered, and bloodied loser after another limping all the way back to the dressing room, not always under their own power. Finally, the time came for the final fight. Bob describes it best in his memoirs. Entering the ring with Dickie behind me, I saw for the first time this guy I was to fight. This animal with no teeth wasn't looking to get into flicks. That was certainly true, and I have to admit, I was enjoying the view as much as Bob was wondering what in the world he was doing in there. But the power of ten bucks and a dare was more than he could handle. So it continued. The fight went for three rounds. As Bob calculated, that was just six minutes to stay alive. At first he held up pretty well, making it through the first round with no major damage. Then, as he tells it, gong, round two. The animal came out, charging again. Bob actually landed a pretty good right, and he made it into the third round. But then he threw another right, and suddenly, lights out. Bob hit the canvas so hard, I thought he was never going to get up. He was unconscious as I dragged him to the dressing room. At least he was still breathing when we laid him on the bench. A few minutes later, he woke up, and I dropped a ten-dollar bill on his stomach. A deal's a deal. The old man also gave Bob a wristwatch. They couldn't pay him money because he was an amateur, but his blood was worth something. There were three obsessions that, according to Bob, he and I shared. Danger, women, and gambling. I need to clarify that a bit. First, Robert Evans was an absolute magnet for women, and I'm talking about when he was still 15. Walking down the street with Bob was a guarantee of female company, whether you were obsessed or not. One day, Bob and I were on Fifth Avenue and spotted the stunning young lady walking opposite us. He said to me, Dickie, that's Lana Turner. This was at the height of her popularity. Bob then said, I'm going to go talk to her. I told him you're crazy. I bet him ten bucks he couldn't get a date with her. I wasn't stupid. I knew how good he was with women. But this was Lana Turner. A few days later, he showed up at the Empire with his new date. When she wasn't looking, I gave him the ten bucks. Bob also dated Grace Kelly. A few years later, he and Grace came to see me in Mr. Roberts, and afterwards we went out to Ruby Foo's on 52nd Street for dinner. Grace was one of those young women who had it all, beauty, intelligence, and a wonderfully charming personality. If anyone was to become a real-life princess, it should have been Grace. In 1982, I went to Monte Carlo on a celebrity tennis tournament and met her again. Now as the Princess of Monaco, we had a wonderful time chatting about Bob Evans and the old days in New York City. I also remember that trip because my son Nels won the celebrity tennis tournament. His doubles partner was O.J. Simpson. I got to know O.J. a little from the various celebrity events. He was always nice to be around, 
and I can attest to his inclination for women. Once, at a celebrity tournament in the Bahamas, I was awakened at around 1 a.m. by a knock at my hotel door. I got up, opened the door, and there were two beautiful girls standing in the hallway. They asked, Is O.J. in here? I politely told them that he wasn't. You know, it's hard to imagine that the guy these girls were looking for and the good-natured fellow we played tennis with would be accused of murdering two young people in cold blood. I didn't follow the case very carefully, but it did seem they had a lot of evidence against him. It ended up a tragedy for all involved. As for Bob Evans, he wasn't just obsessed with women. They were obsessed with him. I've never seen anything like it, and after 80 years, I'm guessing I never will again. As for Bob's claim that we were obsessed with danger, he gives me too much credit. My real obsession was getting him to indulge his own amazing appetite for putting it on the line. One day he was hanging around the NBC studios where we broadcast Young Widow Brown. When I finished my part, I went out in the stairwell and had a cigarette with the other kids. At the time, Smokey didn't have that kind of taboo that's attached to it today. Bob was also there in the stairwell the ambitious kid who would do just about anything to be the center of attention. Knowing that made me think, how could I get him to entertain us? I looked down the middle of the stairwell. It was a straight drop from the third floor to the bottom. So I said to Bob, a buck says you can't hang by your fingers for five minutes. Bob could not resist the challenge. Before I knew it, he had lowered himself from the stairwell and began hanging with his feet dangling in the open air. If he fell, he was dead. I started counting. Bob held on for dear life. I hung and hung, he later wrote. I shut my eyes and counted off the seconds, trying to block out the pain. When three minutes were up, we all grabbed him and pulled him to safety. I'm sure it was just in time. You know, looking back, it's hard to believe that we could have done something so incredibly stupid. But we were young and reckless, and Bob Evans, as Hollywood would soon find out, was one of a kind. While working with the Luntz, I moved out of our apartment at the Des Artis on 67th Street in Manhattan, where I had lived with my mother and my sister Joyce for the past several years. I was 19, and dating a woman, Lois Woodson, who happened to be a friend of my mother's. That made things awkward at home. So Lois and I moved in with her friend, an actress named Norma Anderson, and Norma's boyfriend, also a struggling actor named Burt Lancaster. The four of us lived together in an apartment on 55th Street. Burt was about 10 years older than me and working in a play called The Sound of Hunting. The play bombed, but Burt received excellent reviews, which helped launch his career. Burt was a quiet and reserved guy, though very nice. While living together, we pretty much went our own ways. He did tell me that he was an acrobat. In fact, he had just returned from performing a circus act on a USO tour. It was there that he met Norma, and when I moved in, Norma was pregnant. Later, I recall them telling the newspapers they had adopted a child. In those days, it was a way to avoid any kind of scandal. Soon afterward, they moved to Hollywood. My coming of age in New York also involved the acquisition that was most important to me. I had spent a good portion of my youth at a racetrack, and now I was going to see it all from a new vantage point. 